ओम ज्ञान तिमिरंधस्य ज्ञानांजनि शलाकाय चक्षुरून मिलितम येना तस्मै श्री गुरुवे नमः नमः ओम विष्णु पादाय कृष्ण पृष्ठाय भूतले श्रीमते भक्ति वेदांत स्वामी इति नामिने नमस्ते सारस्वती देवे गौरवाणी प्रचे निर्विशेष शून्यवादी पाश्चात्य देश तारिणे वंचा कल्पतरूभ्य कृपा सिंधुभ्य पतिताम पावनेभ्य वैष्णवेभ्यो नमो नम जय श्री कृष्ण चैतन्य प्रभु निनंद श्री अद्वैत गदाधार श्रीवासादिगौरभक्तवृंद हरे कृष्णा हरे कृष्णा 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 हरे 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 राम हरे राम 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 हरे 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 कृष्णा सो ऑन द ओकेजन ऑफ रामनवमी आवर नॉर्मल फोकस इज ऑन ग्लोरिफाइंग लॉर्ड राम on understanding how he is uh, such a glorious personality at the same time there is another way uh, that we can contemplate on lord ram is to consider those aspects about him which are often not considered which are considered questionable or not so uh, glorious and try to understand them because generally speaking the world is a place of conflict and conflict means what that there are of course physical conflicts and wars but there are also mental conceptual intellectual conflicts and krishna himself says in the bhagavad that when we have tatvatah knowledge of him janmachame divyam evam yoveti tatvatah त्यक्त्वा देहं पुनर्जन्म नैतिमामेति सो अर्जुन सो व्हेन वी हैव तत्वतः नॉलेज व्हेन वी हैव प्रॉपर होलिस्टिक नॉलेज अबाउट हु ही इज सो दैट टाइम व्हाट हैपेंस इज वी विल बिकम सो अट्रैक्टेड टू हिम दैट वी विल अटेन हिम दैट वी विल मूव टुवर्ड्स हिम सो देयरफॉर it is important to get that tatvatah understanding the tatvatah generally we means it means philosophy but tatva simply means truth so now if we understand the truth about krishna about the lord then we can move forward and get a holistic picture of what is actually happening and what to do about it now with respect to the lord ram he is often considered to be the embodiment of virtue and it is true he is remar- remarkably virtuous person and to that end many of his activities it's very very difficult to find any fault with them that's why if there are some activities which are questionable <coughs> then sometimes there is a lot of zeroing in on those questions so one such activity of lord ram which needs to be carefully understood is the activity is role in enthroning sugriv by dethroning vali so most of us know the past time so i will not go into the details of the past time just a quick overview and the way i'll be discussing this past time is uh, we'll be analyzing it more than discussing it the past time itself so when lord ram was in the forest searching for sita at that time he came across sugriv at uh, through hanuman and then sugriv and ram formed an alliance and when that alliance was formed sugriv said that i will offer all the royal resources of kishkinda to assist in searching for sita but i although i am a prince i have been deprived of it all and when lord ram heard about, about the whole misunderstanding which had happened how wali had suspected that sugriv had tried to kill him and had tried to usurp him uh, take over his kingdom and then 
because of that wali tried to repeat first exiled sukhdev and then tried to repeatedly kill him so lord ram felt that this was an extremely unjust unfair action by by sukhdev towards sukhdev by wali and then what happened basically is that when the two of them were fighting lord ram told sukhdev you, you go and challenge wali now wali was much more powerful so wali bet sukhdev up and then sukhdev fled and then lord ram said i couldn't differentiate between the two of you you are although you're not twins you are quite identical so he said you wear a garland and then you go and then when he went with the garland again at that time wali soon got the upper hand was about to pound sukhdev to death at that time lord ram shot an arrow and that went clean through into the chest of wali and then wali fell and wali eventually uh, perished so what exactly was going on normally the kshatriya code what is the questionable about it is from wali himself raised this question and the kshatriya code says that you know two people should fight face to face with one another and especially when person a is fighting with person b c shouldn't directly shoot without any warning and shoot to kill so that is not proper so why would lord ram resort to something like this so to understand this let's consider some of the arguments that were made at that particular point and then we'll also discuss some other arguments that were made so to begin how do we assess unfairness you know when we say okay this is unfair this is fair how do we actually go about assessing it and why sometimes we need to consider the bigger picture while assessing what is right and what is wrong and then we also need to consider not just the content of the action but also the intent behind the action and the consequence of the action to be able to decide what is right and what is wrong so when we want to assess and we want to evaluate unfairness so if there is some dreaded terrorist and the government gives a shoot of side shoot at side order or maybe some bystander bystander who is ignorant about what is happening that that person see though just the police just came there no warning or the military came and they shot this person indiscriminately what's going on over here why did they shoot like this now, now we may think of terrorists as having a particular image maybe they look like terrorists whatever we are consider of terrorists but not everybody looks like that if somebody if this person seems to be dressed quite respectably and conducting himself quite politely uh then we may think oh what was this why did this happen like this <clears throat> now sometimes the idea is given that uh, that you know people who are poor people who are exploited people who are igno edu ignorant and educated they become radicalized yes that may happen but sometimes if you see any of the leaders of terror extremist organizations they are not uneducated some of them have if you see in the middle east they have degrees from the west and they come from quite wealthy families also so appearances can be deceptive so <clears throat> so immediate context can sometimes mislead sometimes a person might be doing something harmless apparent you know that person might be sitting in the room reading a maybe watching tv and then suddenly somebody bursts in and shoots them what's going on so their present activity might be harmless but their overall life might be harmful there might be even, it might be even dreadful so the idea is that when we have to assess something we see only the immediate context of the situation and yes the immediate context is important but the immediate context may not give us the full picture of the situation and that's why we need to look at the broader or broader situation that's why we need to look at the bigger picture so what does the bigger picture mean in this particular context so wali was an aggressor hmm? so what he had done was he had tried to kill his younger brother he had tried to uh he had eventually taken his younger brother's wife as his own wife and that why he had committed incest it was not exactly incest but it was near incest so these are serious crimes so actually speaking uh, i'll discuss this in broadly three parts 
let's look at what is the discussion that wali himself has with lord ram and i won't go into the whole discussion there are pages of discussion in the valmiki ramayana and other retellings of the ramayana also there is further elaborate discussion but we'll just discuss some points over there then we'll discuss from a contemporary perspective what the examples mean and then we will see what all this means for us so broadly speaking in the vedic context now vedic jurisprudence that means the vedic system of justice may not exactly apply in today's world but at least we can get a sense of what is happening so what do i mean by that in the vedic tradition there is the concept of atatainaha so atataina means literally it essentially it means aggressor literally it means one who has come with a stretched bow stretched bow what it means is like like somebody has a gun okay the gun is in their pocket or gun the gun is on their back that's one thing but the gun is right in their hands the gun is loaded and the finger is on the trigger that means if something is not done they are going to shoot and they may shoot and they may kill so like if somebody has a loaded gun with the finger on the trigger that means disaster is about to happen if that person is not stopped so similarly the word atataina it means not just an aggressor in a conceptual sense of the word it means an aggressor who has the bow stretched that means the arrow is there on the bow as we know traditionally when bows are to be shot what happens is it has to be stretched backwards the string has to be stretched backward and then the arrow gets propelled forward so one whose bow is already stretched that means they are about to shoot so it's aggressor who is on the who has committed aggression and who is on the verge of committing aggression so that is the context over here so wali was an aggressor oh and he had tried to kill his earlier brother now we may say that okay but he didn't he have just cause okay that he had tried tried to kill him and that's why he did the same well yes and no because he was clearly uh, the more powerful mon mon monkey manavana and therefore he didn't have to immediately kill sugriva he could have at least allowed sugriva to hear to get could given sugriva hearing no okay what 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 is your side of the story why did you do this sugriva had served him faithfully for several decades they had grown up as siblings and sugriva had always been his stalwart assistant so he didn't give the benefit of the doubt to his younger brother and then not only did he exile his brother so in one sense there is a stark difference lord ram was exiled from the forest from the kingdom to the forest and even sugri was exiled from the kingdom to the forest but in the case of lord ram there was no animosity between him and his brother in this case the relevant brother was bharat but in the case of uh, sugri there was animosity the animosity was so strong that wali was trying repeatedly to kill him and then this is that were not bad enough as i said that he even took his younger brother's wife so there were there was definitely culpability on the side of wali in many ways wali was virtuous you know, he was a powerful person he was in his own way virtuous but often power gets to the head and wali's own wife tara had repeatedly told him that you know reconcile with your brother now why are you continuing on this for so long just put an end to it now but he just never he never agreed to that and eventually this fight happened and in this fight what happened is now within the vedic court of system that there is no sin is incurred in killing the aggressors so now there is a question over here can that means can the kill, aggressors be killed in any way or do the aggressors have to be fought fairly and killed that means if a thief is about to uh, a thief is about to rob somebody's house then does some does somebody who's stopping them they have to confront the thief from the front side and fight a fair fight and then kill the thief or the thief is robbing so anyway you can come from behind also and kill the thief 
well there are different contexts which which require a different uh, application the idea is that like in the kurukshetra war the war was designated at a particular place the pan the aggression had already happened the pandavas had lived out the term of the exile and when they didn't agree to the kauravas didn't agree to return the kingdom the pandava said that we are going to declare a war so that war was a face to face war where it was the war, it was fought according to the codes of war but in general that it is not absolute principle that if somebody has is an aggressor they have to be fought in a fray, in a fair fight and they have to be killed that it's like you know, if a criminal is facing a civilian criminal is about to threaten a civilian the criminal is armed maybe the criminal is killed and the civilian is neither armed nor skilled for fighting the civilian has to protect themselves they can't do it in a straight uh, face off they may have to use some ambush attack or some strategy as it is called asymmetric warfare so the point is aggressors can be killed that is one point now it's interesting what happens is when lord ram kills or shoots wali now lord ram could have shot to kill him immediately his arrow went into his chest and lord ram had demonstrated to sugriva earlier that his arrows could pierce through not just one huge tall tree but seven tall trees and then go through the earth go right through the earth and then come out and come back into uh, ram's quiver so his arrow had that prowess but lord ram didn't shoot him to kill immediately so wali fell to the ground and then wali looked around who could have shot so unfairly so heinously and he said oh ram i had heard that you were virtuous but how could you kill like this you know it is probably because you are associated with my evil minded brother that you have also become contaminated by bad association he says what what harm have i ever done to you we have no enmity so why did you kill me when i was fighting with someone else so lord ram's reply is very 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 uh, significant he doesn't say over there uh, that actually you uh, you know he, his his answer is that his his humility as well as his responsibility comes out over there he says that you say you did me no harm but you are doing you did harm to your own brother and the king of ayodhya is the protector of the entire earth there was a hierarchy of kings generally the idea was that there would there would be kings and then there would be like a emperor so ayodhya was a very powerful kingdom and he says that as the i am this the king of ayodhya is meant to protect everyone and the king of ayodhya is meant to protect and meant protect other everyone in the world and is meant to maintain law and order in the world so you have unfairly dealt with your brother you have tried to kill your brother he may remain say the same things and therefore as a member of the royal family therefore as a representative and servant of the current reigning king of ayodhya bharat now it is for me to correct the wrong that you have done so what ram lord ram was doing was not what is sometimes called as vigilante justice vigilante justice means that that sometimes some people this is there are many movies where some hero finds that the politicians are corrupt the police are corrupt that everybody in the media is corrupt and the hero takes the law in their own hands and just starts going on a rampage of killing all those who are considered to be wrong doers now in movies vigilante justice might seem quite uh, sensational it may make for some great action sec action sequences but actually in real life vigilante justice can be disastrous if everybody starts taking the law in their own hands then society will descend into chaos so in general in any civilized society uh, 
it is the law enforcers it is the government through its appropriate wings such as the police or the military that has a monopoly on the use of violence if anybody else starts using violence they are culpable by the law of course if the government also use excessive or disproportionate violence then the, the government is also uh, subject to uh, subject to correction the law enforcers are also under the law they are not above the law but the point is lord ram was not just doing this hey, you know sugriv is my friend i and i want sugriv's resources for finding my wife so that's why i it i'll kill you and then we'll gain the kingdom that was not lord ram's conscience at all when he heard about the unfair way in which wali was wali had dealt with sugriv and therefore he said that i had to correct this wrong and then they have a elaborate discussion over there and there's to and fro wali says that you know you shouldn't have killed me you know, monkeys are not meant to be eaten also our flesh is not to be eaten this is that is not so lord ram refutes one by one is all his arguments but at the end of it lord ram tells him that if you still think that my killing of you has been unfair and just say so and i will withdraw the arrow from your chest and you will be restored to your health and when lord ram speaks this what happens is wali becomes silent he becomes pensive and then he acknowledges yes a part of me always felt that i i treated sugriv too harshly but it was my pride that would never allowed me to admit that i had done some wrong and i have got the just the just results for my own mistreatment of my brother but then at that time he turns toward his brother while now here what is happening is he turns to his brother sugriv and sugriv is filled with remorse and he hears his brother speaking like this and sugriv is not licking his lips in glee thinking oh now i got the kingdom it's it is not a nefarious plot like that so what is happening over here is that there is a very sweet and uplifting reconciliation that happens so swali tells sugriv that you no know, my wife tara and my son angad my son angad is innocent my wife actually wanted me to reconcile with you but i didn't listen to her so you, i had wronged you but please and i deserve the punishment that i got but please don't hold it against them so at that time sugriv says that you know i he, he accepts that responsibility and he turns to angad angad and uh, tara i also come there and tells both of them you know angad don't think that sugriv has caused death. it is my own misdeed that have caused the death so treat respect him just as the way you respect me and uh, work with him and then he tells tara also you are a very wise person if i had listened to your counsel uh, this wouldn't have happened but please stay under the shelter of my brother and give your wise counsel to him he will hear it better and in this way he has full reconciliation and then he takes out a, a jewel necklace that he has that has been given to him by his celestial father indra wali is celestial the son of indra and sugriv is the son of uh surya surya so so what happens is that he gives his necklace to sugriv as an indication of reconciliation he could have naturally given his that necklace was a very powerful and precious necklace and as long as a person would be wearing that necklace that person would that body their body would not die we I mean pain there would be injury but death would not happen so he could very easily have given that necklace to his own son and nobody would have faulted him for that but wali gave it to sugriv and why was that because he genuinely wanted to make amends for the wrong he had done and then once again uh, now this this is this is what is told in the valmiki ramayana now there are further retellings uh, we could say embellishments of the story further details are revealed in later retellings of the ramayana so in later retellings it is described that 
Lord Ram offers him again. He said, you know, your heart has changed now. Uh, I can give you back your life. And Wali says, you know, lives we all live many times. But a death like this in your divine presence is extremely rare. So I, I choose death. And beholding Lord Ram, he departs from the world. So what is happening over here is that there is a reconciliation. And that reconciliation is such that the person who is, who is considered to be the victim, that person accepts that what was done was just. So we may not necessarily understand the specific arguments. We may not find the specific arguments persuasive. We can go into that and I will elaborate on the arguments again a little bit later. But the point I'm making is, suppose say two people have a conflict, say two siblings have a conflict, sometimes the husband and wife have some conflict. And then they patch it up, they resolve the issue. But then a third person comes and says, hey, you, know, you know, that person treated you so unfairly. Oh, no, we have resolved it. No, no, no. Why are you, why are you continuing on with tolerating this injustice? He says, no, it is okay. So if a third person comes and instigates, then what happens is the issue that has already been resolved is again aggravated, is again worsened. And that is entirely unnecessary. So what happens is that overall, it is vital to understand that within the, within the worldview at that time, within the reasoning of the characters, Wali did not consider it unfair. Although initially he vehemently opposed, eventually he accepted that what he had done was wrong. So this brings us to the point that when we talk about ethics, you know, the ethics, there are two kinds of ethics. There is categorical ethics and there are contextual ethics. So categorical means it's a category. This is right and this is wrong. We have discussed this earlier briefly once. So categorical ethics means right is one category and wrong is one category. And say like shooting somebody from behind is wrong and there's no discussion about it. So this is one category. That is another category. However, reality is quite messy. You know, what is right and what is wrong can be from time, place, circumstance. So, as a common example is given ethics, that if somebody, normally speaking, lies is bad. But if there's a group of rioters who have come to kill our friend, and our friend has asked us, please save me, please and we hide them in our basement. I hide our friend in the basement and those rioters come and ask, is this person here? Should we speak the truth at that time? So speaking truth will cause the death of a person. Not speaking the truth will save the person. So that means what? That although speaking truth is good and speaking lies is bad, there is a hierarchy of ethics that more important than speaking the truth may well be preserving the life of someone. And therefore, rather than thinking of ethics simply as categorical it's also contextual yes in general speaking truth is good speaking right uh, speaking uh, falsehood is bad but there are situations which can be complicated which can be nuanced and that means we have to consider the situation so consider the situation means what basically this is the action that was done so in what context was the action done so to understand the context, we need to look at what comes before and what comes after. So what comes before is look at the incidents before that and primarily look at the intent of the person in doing that. And what comes after means look at the results that come out of it. That is the consequence. So intent and consequence, these two have to be considered. So now in the later retellings, of the Ramayana, there's a further reason that is given. So the further reason that is given is that Wali had a particular blessing. What was that? And that uh, Wali had been, it was Wali's blessing means Wali, ha, Wali had been blessed with this power that anybody who would confront him, that person's half power would come to Wali. So what would happen is if Wali is fighting with someone, then Wali has his own power and his opponent has his own power. But 
the blessing was such that half of opponent's power would come to Wali. And because of that, Wali would become much more powerful than any opponent. Hmm. And that way, Wali would become undefeatable. And in fact, even, even Ravan had been bested by Wali. Uh, Ravan had become very puffed up with his prowess. And he had tried to challenge Wali, but Wali had nonchalantly crushed him. But then eventually Ravan had begged, uh, had begged for amnesty, forgiveness, and mm, it's a complex story, but basically Wali and Ravan had formed an alliance and that you stay off my territory and I'll stay off your territory. Later on, when uh, the Vanar Sena came to Lanka, Ravan tried repeatedly to, uh, to revive that alliance, first by tempting Sugri, who was the current king. And when Sugri rejected the temptation, then he tried to tempt Angad by saying that, you know, I had a very good alliance with your father and your father was killed by his own brother. How disgraceful this is. You know, let's revive our alliance and I'll ensure that you become the king. Uh, but of course, Angad also rejected his uh, proposition. The point is that Wali had great power. So in one sense, what happened was the, the blessing was such that you could say the blessing rigged every fight. Every fight that they might be having, he was going to get half the power of his opponent. And then his own power plus half the power of the opponent and half the power of the opponent lost. There's just no way anyone could win against him. So now, of course, we can say that the Lord is supreme and nothing is impossible for the Lord. That is true. But what the Lord does is, in general, if a blessing is given to anybody by the Devtas, the Lord does not, uh, does not defy that blessing. Because ultimately, the Devtas power also comes from Krishna. And in order to maintain the universal order, Krishna ensures that the Devtas' words remain true. Mm -hmm that uh, the satyam vidhatum nijibhritti bhashitam as it is said about Narasimha Dev that when he appeared he maintained the truth of the words of his nijibhritti of his servant that could refer to Prahlad's word yes Vishnu is there in his particular uh, pillar also that could also be referred to Narad Muni's blessing to Kayadu that your son will always be protected but that can also refer to Brahmaji saying that no being created my be will be able to kill you. So in general, so Narasimha Dev, he maintains the truth of the word of his, words of his servant. Why? Because, you know, if, if those, who are meant, those who are having power, those who are meant to empower, protect others, if they don't honor their word, or if their word is not honored, society's structure will collapse. Mm. So therefore, Lord Ram also honored the word of uh, the honored the blessing which Wali had been given, and therefore, he, rather than uh, rather than uh, disrupting the blessing, Lord Ram was ready to take upon himself the infamy of having killed somebody by shooting an arrow from behind. Just like Krishna, he wanted to honor the word of Bhishma. Bhishma had said that I will cause. I'll ask, either cause Krishna to raise a weapon or I will kill Arjun. So Krishna, in order to honor Bhishma's word, what did Krishna do? He put aside his own word that, okay, I will not be raising any weapons. I will not be fighting. I will be a non-combatant. He had given that word before the war, but Krishna was ready to change that. That is Krishna's greatness. So Lord Ram wanted to honor the blessing. So that's why, what did Lord Ram do? He agreed. The blessing which had been given is, that was what Lord Ram decided not to confront Wali directly, but to call, confront him from, uh, to shoot an arrow while he was not directly confronting. That way his uh, arrow's potency would be there. At the same time, the blessing which Wali had would also not be lost. So if we look in this case at the consequence of the action, Although Wali was, as mentioned, Wali was initially enraged by Ram's actions, he was eventually persuaded by Ram's reasoning. And there was a sweet reconciliation. 
that's why i mentioned that if the so called victim of an apparent injustice is convinced that um, it was not actually injustice then maybe it is important for us also to recognize that maybe this was not actually injustice but i don't have to superimpose my conceptions of justice and injustice on that particular situation that particular transaction let's try to understand uh, the situation as those characters have understood it so one of the things about studying anything historical is that it is often said that history is like a foreign territory but the things are done differently over there so rather than saying hey that person is doing right that person is doing wrong we have to understand okay what was the situation over there what are the customs over there what are the what are the systems of justice over there and the in terms of consequence there was a very the wali accepted that he had done wrong and there was a reconciliation in the entire family and of course because wali departed in the presence of the lord he was elevated and liberated so as i mentioned sometimes the husband and wife they have a quarrel and they patch up but if there are attorneys involved and they what they want to prolong the conflict so that they can mint money out sometimes some small accident happens and there are uh, like the ambulance chasers is attorneys who just uh, who lawyers and all those people who just want to prolong a case to make money so as i said lord ram uh, lord ram was confident that he had done the right action that's why he gave that categorical assurance to wali as if you stay if you say so that i if you still feel that i have killed you unfairly i will restore your life so this is now we are not taking the argument over here lord ram is god and whatever he does is perfect so that is an argument that can also be taken but that is not the tack which we are taking over here in general in the puranas in the itihasas see the bhakti tradition considers the lord's actions to be perfect and that is fine but, but in the in the mahabharat or for that matter in the ramayan that is not the mood of the authors um so for example krishna tells arjuna uh, to shoot karna even when his arrow is even when he is down so karna so arjuna has some hesitation and karna also feels this is outrageous and karna says don't entertain thoughts entertained by cowards and remember the codes of virtue so krishna doesn't say over oh, that i am god whatever i say is virtue that is not the mood that krishna uses over there krishna says oh really karna you are talking about virtue now was it was it by the codes of virtue that you suggested that draupadi be disrobed was it by the codes of virtue that you you conspired to have the pandavas along with their saintly mother burnt alive in varanavart was it by virtue that you along with five other warriors simultaneously attacked the 16 year old abhimanyu who was in a situation similar to yours abhimanyu was charioteless abhimanyu was weaponless and you attacked him so the if that was the virtue you followed at that time arjuna will follow the same virtue now so arjuna shoot so the in general in the ethics the there is contemplation on dharma the right thing to do and there is resolution of dharma based on the codes of morality it is not just resolution by authority you know this is what krishna says so that's why this is what lord ram says and lord ram is perfect or krishna says krishna is perfect that is not the mood also the bhakti tradition may see it that way but that is not the mood of the epics themselves even in the bhagavatam in 1.7 where the son of drona punishes the chapter where what to do with ashwatthama krishna doesn't give a direct instruction to ashwa to arjun arjun has to resolve and reconcile the different positions that on one side yudhishthir and draupadi has and on another side uh, bhima has so the idea is there is reasoning going on over here and lord ram is confident about his moral reasoning over here and then so what happens with respect to wali in terms of consequences if he considered he was freed from the arrogance that had blinded him he was freed from this from sin because of his wrong doings and he was freed from material existence because of dying in lord ram's presence so what is happening is in terms of consequence everyone is benefited now was sugriva a wrong doer was had sugriva conspired and instigated ram by just telling one side of the story 
नो एक्चुअली सुग्रीवा हैड ट्राइड रिकन्सिलेशन मेनी टाइम्स सो वी ट्राई टू कम बैक टू वालीज किंगडम एंड ट्राई टू एक्सप्लेन वॉट एड हैपन बट वाली वुड जस्ट नॉट लिसन वाली वुड इमीजिएटली टारगेट हिम एंड ट्राई टू किल हिम सो ही हैड लिव फॉर मेनी इयर्स एज अ फ्यूजिटिव एंड देन इवन आफ्टर दैट वेन इज ब्रदर डाइड he broke down and he said i have committed the sin of fratricide you know my brother who was like my father i have caused his death today i do not deserve to live but sukri said i will enter into the funeral pyre the same fire that will burn my brother's body let it burn my body also and let angad become the king so at that time lakshman consoled him lakshman instructed him and then lord ram also instructed him so the point is sukri was not a power grabber by any means now as some people who say the question is that if wali did something wrong by taking sugriv's wife then sugriv also took wali's wife afterwards no but there is a big big difference over there first of all with respect to sugriv's wife ruma sugriv was still alive and now there are different codes of morality and wali himself tells sugriv uh, that or while it is watara and sugri both you know you can live under his shelter and if the husband is deceased then for the codes which are which govern the vanara society you now uh, <clears throat> a wife can live with her brother in law excepting the brother in law as a husband but there are different codes of morality at different places just like in the heavens it is said that when ur when urvashi wanted propositioned herself to arjuna she said we apsaras are not governed by earthly rules so you will not be committing any immorality you don't have to see me as your as a mother figure she says no but i am not governed by those so arjuna said i am i am not i am presently in heaven but i am a earthly being but the point i am making is there are different codes of morality at different places the key difference was that it was on the instruction of wali and it was also after the departure of wali so that is not considered immoral and that is certainly not an abduction so so what sugriva what wali did was was an was almost like abduction and a violation but what sugriva did was not so overall the theme here is that all is well that ends well even if the trajectory that is taken to get to that end may sometimes seem questionable for us the fact that there was reconciliation the fact that there was a auspicious consequence for everyone indicates that overall what lord ram did was was for the good of everyone involved so that's why ji there is black and there is white and in the ramayana the boundaries of black and white are relatively clearer are relatively clear but when there are some questions about black and white at that time how do we understand them carefully it is by looking at the broader picture by looking at the intended consequence not that the white becomes black because of one questionable action but rather we need to recognize that what we think is black may be a shade of gray and may not be black and in the real world what is right and wrong has to be carefully understood so lord ram he is he is demonstrating the duty of a ideal human being or how what are the characteristics of ideal human being and one aspect of such behavior is to acknowledge that life is that life brings us with complex situations and what is the right thing to do is not easy so how lord ram confronts ethical dilemmas and how he resolves the ethical dilemmas that is also indicative mm. that is also indicative of um, <clears throat> sorry that what happened was the big if you understand the big picture then things can move forward and issues can be resolved so let's su i'll summarize what we discussed today so i discussed three main points first is that uh, how when we look at 
what is unfair we have to look at the not just the immediate context but the bigger picture and when they look at the bigger picture then we see that an action has to be judged not just by its particular con content of the action but also by the context not just categorical ethics but contextual ethics look at the intent and look at the consequence so lord ram was not not simply acting opportunistically or as a vigilante justice he was acting as a representative of the ruling king and also the consequence was auspicious for everyone and rather than superimposing our ethical conceptions on ancient on situations in a different epoch we try to understand how the characters are conferring an understanding and based on that we can resolve the issue thank you very much hare krishna are there any reflections or questions hare krishna chaitanya charan prabhu ji dhanyawad pranam prabhu thank you very very much prabhu for explaining us demystifying us this complex or and not so evident past time and thank you prabhu so prabhu one question i had prabhu like uh, uh, how did wali get this blessing prabhu uh, of of obtaining the power of uh, opponent right 50% of the power from the opponent just thinking about that i haven't found any reference to specifics of how it happened Uh -huh. i can check it out if you want okay. i'll get back to you sure prabhu so prabhu one more thing uh, prabhu this one like a uh, say in a setting where we are talking about lot past times and somebody asks the same question right now it is a long topic right prabhu we can't you know justify you know in 2 minutes when we respond to somebody how do we in that situation how do we respond prabhu like well if somebody wants a two minute answer then i think it's best not to have that discussion with them because there are many ethical situations uh -huh. in in real life also it's very difficult to resolve ethical dilemmas uh, in uh, those who want to make answers they are just not really my understanding would be they're not really interested in they're only interested in reinforcing their own conceptions no so, not to answer prabhu but in a audience where uh, we give a class right and we ask the speaker this question right so now the speaker doesn't have lot of time at hand to explain in detail yeah okay. so my understanding would be just broadly explain the concept of context contextual and categorical ethics mm. and after explaining that contextual and categorical ethics then after that mm, two things is that we explain the context over here and how what was done was uh, was may seem wrong but it was not wrong so i would say in this particular in general once you explain the idea of con contextual and con concept categorical ethics that itself makes things a lot clearer or that at least gives a foundation for making things clearer okay. and then after that we can discuss uh, further about um, the specifics of the issue so the point that wali himself was satisfied the point that wali had done something wrong that is those are also points to be considered okay yeah okay. yeah thank you very much prabhu dandavat pranam prabhu thank so you, if Hare anybody Krishna. has any questions or comments please you can unmute and uh... hari krishna prabhu ji dandavat pranams it was such a wonderful analytical class and you know it was so such a complex thing had been has been explained like with great simplicity prabhu ji dandavat pranams to you i had this question i just came to my mind suppose if lord ram had fought face to face with wali and if suppose even if lord ram's half the power had been transferred to wali even with that that half the power of lord ram was actually way more than wali's and would have been and he would have been able to no so that's of, why i would say that is a that's why i, I you know many speakers when i ask this question i had asked this question they just start with this answer and i would say that that is an answer which i just mentioned additionally the valmiki ramayana doesn't mention it and wali is satisfied without that so that's why i i will never give that answer i would prefer not to give that answer at all okay because so that is just an additional detail told in the later retelling of the valmiki of the ramayana okay. which can seem very convincing but that is not the reason used by lord ram himself in valmiki ramayana 
So we can say you, you can go into justification. Lord Ram's power is unlimited. So if it's infinity, half of infinity is also infinity only. You can go into that direction. But since just for the sake of completeness of that discussion, I mentioned that as an incidental point as one, but that that was not the thrust of the discussion at all. Mm -hmm. And uh, just like there are many things about Lord Ram, Ram Lila, say for example, the idea of Maya Sita, mm -hmm. that is not mentioned in Valmiki Ram. I'm not saying it's not true, but that's not mentioned in Valmiki Ram. Mm -hmm. So even this uh, Lord, uh, this uh, this the boon of Vali that he has, he can take half of the opponent's power is also not mentioned, Prabhuji. Mm -hmm. Yes, it is not mentioned there. Okay, Prabhuji. Yeah, okay. All right, Prabhuji. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for the wonderful interpretation and explanations, Prabhuji. Hare Krishna. Done what pronouns. Thank you. Okay, Sundari Gopi Mataji is asking over here that when and how should we get into fair and unfair? Well, I think there are two things over here. One is our particular position and second is our disposition. That means uh, if we are in a particular position where we are responsible for what is going on, say if we are taking care of certain group of devotees, if we are in, in charge of a particular project, if we are in charge of a particular department, as much as possible, we need to consider fair and unfair so that things are done properly. So if it is our position, then, oh no, this is how things happen. And uh, we, we can't be negligent at that time if it is our position. And second is that mm, disposition is that sometimes some issues we feel strongly about, sometimes based on our particular background, from our particular background, uh, we might get worked up about a particular thing, say, uh, there are different kinds of wrongs that are there in the world, but we might feel very strongly about particular wrong and that can apply even within our movement also. So if we feel strongly worked up about a particular thing, then we may need to consult the, uh, consult the authorities, uh, the relevant authorities and get some proper understanding and maybe be a part of setting things right if it is, if it is within our capacity to do so. So it's our position and our disposition that determines two things. Okay. And what about Gopal Prabhu is asking about what are the lessons from this past time? Well, this is more of a, we could say resolving a misconception or addressing a misconception rather than a more of a practical lesson. The practical lesson, if at all we want to draw is that determining right and wrong is not that easy. No. Arjun, Arjun was able to very effortlessly resist the temptation of Urvashi when she offered herself. She was a celestial damsel, extremely attractive. But that same Arjun couldn't decide on the Kurukshetra battle, should I fight or should I not fight? Should I stick to my Kshatriya Dharma and fight? Or should I stick to my Kula Dharma and protect my family members and not fight? So ethical dilemmas are extremely difficult to resolve. And rather than rushing to judgment, we need to carefully contemplate. So we may also may quickly decide that this is wrong and this is right. So we can basically, if at all practical lesson we want to draw, we can draw the lesson that don't rush to judgment with respect to complex situations. Okay. So shall we stop here? Okay, that's Megha Mataji. One last question Hare. we can have. Yes, Hare Krishna Prabhuji, please accept my humble obeisances. I'll go to Shila Prabhupada and Shri Guru and Shri Gauranga. Prabhuji, thank you so much for such a beautiful lecture um, in this past time. You know how it's very contradictory to a lot of people and um, explaining, you know, uh, the points that you you know made. Uh, it's a great tool to uh, help everyone understand that this was actually um, in, in a way ethical. Um, and uh, the point I want to try to ask uh, is about in real life. Um, so perceptions don't change for some people. Uh, despite, um, you know, in in the case that we try to explain the intentions, the bigger picture and everything, but it's based on someone's um, perception that doesn't make sense, what we're trying to explain. How, I mean, at the, at the end it is, you know, we can just try so much to help someone understand. 
the points or whatever, right? Then at that some certain point, you just have to stop. So in those instances, um, should we just let the other person's perception be what it is instead of trying to change anything? Yeah, it's a tough question. Again, it depends on uh, how important it is for us to uh, understand, for us to recognize. Say, it is not that we have the responsibility to correct everyone's misconceptions. And uh, it is also that sometimes it may be, I write articles on the Gita every day. So mm -hmm. I also post some quotes on WhatsApp. So I'm just posting a thought based on 1311, which I had given that uh, I'll post in the chat now that mm -hmm. when you talk about detachment, what detachment, we talk about detachment means that, you know, don't generally we talk about emotional attachment, but also in terms mm -hmm. of opinions, detachment means that if someone has a wrong opinion about us, mm -hmm. we don't feel an overpowering need to prove to them that their opinion is wrong. It could be about us, about a particular issue. Hmm. We can be at peace with their right to have a wrong opinion. Krishna says, Vivikta Desha Sevitvam Aratirjana Samsadi. That, uh, that the way people in general think, a uh, knowledgeable person learns to be detached from that. Hmm. That means what? That you know, we are we recognize our finiteness. We are not God. Even God can't correct people's wrong opinions. Even Krishna yeah. couldn't correct Duryodhan's opinion. So if we have a particular relationship with that person, if we feel we have a responsibility in that relationship, we mm -hmm. can try to help them arrive at a more evolved understanding. Mm -hmm. But if that doesn't work out, mm -hmm. then we can be, yeah, let them, it's, they have to learn their own lessons and they have to, they will evolve to a higher understanding in their own course. So we need to be detached. So we can make an effort to help, mm -hmm. but if it doesn't, then we have to learn to be detached. Yeah, but let's see the, the same thing perception. So let's say you know when I say something to evolve the the consciousness of the other person, the other person will go ask uh, maybe even like a senior devotee, right? Um, and it it aligns with you know what do you call this the perception um, of her you know of the the person or something. In that case, you know, we, it's again, I know that, you know, from, from the perspective that the, the devotees will be able to preach to a person in a manner that they understand, right? Like the, the um, other person understands easily. Uh, maybe I'm not doing that. Uh, and in that case, you know, it just keeps on, you know, it's impossible for sometimes to help people understand the very evolved consciousness at at a certain stage. Um, and in that case, you know, just to help them really come out of the their um, because if, if you let them think how they are thinking, it is only making things worse for them in the long run. So when we try to under help them understand our perspective in a more evolved way, and then they start questioning because of their perception of our understanding is, is incorrect. With that perception, they ask someone else. So then there's a big convolution. So I think I'm understanding your, your answer to be detached. So let, let the person- no, so my, no, I understand where you're coming from. So the thing is that uh, we can't, we can try to help other people arrive at a better understanding, but if we, they don't, what can we do? Yeah. Yeah. We can't, and sometimes it's, uh, different people have different levels of power and influence. Yeah. So yeah. if somebody influential, relatively speaking, has a negative opinion about us and they spread that, mm -hmm. that's, that's unfortunate. It's, yeah. uh, it's, it's just how both fame and infamy work in the world. Okay. You know, it's like somebody has a particular opinion, somebody makes a write a particular article, a particular book, a particular video. No, th there is a whole, oh, there's a lot of research done about why some content becomes viral on social media and why it doesn't. Now, two content exactly similar, but one becomes yeah. viral, the other doesn't become. Right. So, you no, know, it's it's difficult. It has to be. It's not just based solely on the content. 
with the circumstances what are there at that time what is the overall ethos of people who sees it who shares it to whom so we understand here that destiny also plays a role Hmm. so destiny sometimes plays a role that means that some people they do something and they get a lot of either fame or infamy because of that hmm. and some people do something and they don't get fame or they don't get infamy also and they may do something good hmm. and not get fame they may do something bad and they not get infamy hmm. so we have to see what is in our prowess to do okay. and if we do that that is all you know we see in the mahabharat itself while the pandavas were in exile Duryodhan was on an aggressive campaign to malign the Pandavas, and he was quite successful. Initially, at the start of the exile, Krishna and Balaram came to to meet the Pandavas, and both of them were enraged at the way Draupadi had been treated. Uh, but after the exile got over, and they were living in the kingdom of Virat. there uh, krishna and arjuna also krishna and balram came to meet uh, meet uh, meet the pandavas and there mm. the Pand- uh, there balram said you know yudhishthir you need to be humble in approaching duryodhan after all nobody forced you to gamble it was mm. you yourself gambled it was your mistake and okay. whatever has happened is because of your own mistake so what the, the pandavas were quite distressed to hear this so basically Duryodhan had spun his own yarn. Had told his own side of the story, and mm-hmm. that's what it. And that's how it was that Duryodhan was able to get eleven Akshayuni soldiers. That many alliances he was able to form because he told his own side of the story, and the mm-hmm. Pandavas had to live with that. Mm-hmm. So it's unfortunate. But sometimes in the world, even those who have not done wrong, they may also be maligned. They may mm-hmm. also be. uh they may also be be subjected to others negative opinions and the results of those negative opinions what can be yeah. done about it okay yes yes thank you so much prabhu ji that's really helpful hari krishna thank you yeah. thank you so, so basically sometimes we need to accept it and not like yeah. think that uh, okay we it just acceptance is required that it, it is like karma you know the nature of the world is everything is temporary so even infamy is temporary fame is temporary mm-hmm. but infamy is also temporary yeah. the generally we say oh this person will speak badly about me that speak badly about me and what will everybody think about me but what happens is this kind of controversial things they stay in the public memory till the next controversy comes up mm-hmm. and something other something other scandalous something else something controversial something sensational will come up and it will go into the background Yeah, so I think it's um, as you say, you know, as this is our, I, I take this as Krishna's plan and his arrangement to purify, uh, purify. Yes, I guess my consciousness and everything. So, um, thank you so much, that's Hare true. Krishna. Thank you very much, Hare Krishna. Shri Ramachandra Bhagwan ki jai. Yeah. Thank you, thank you very much, Prabhu ji, for your yeah. valuable time and association. Prabhu ji, thank you very much. Hare Krishna, thank you, Prabhu. Thank you, Prabhu. Hello. Okay, who is this? This is Ajay Prabhu. Raj Prabhu. Okay, yes. Raj Prabhu has made a quite a humorous comment. Thank you. Yeah, go ahead. <coughs> yeah. Thank you, Prabhu Ji, for the nice uh, uh, discourse. Yeah, Just one quick question, Prabhu Ji. Uh, one of the reasons I heard Ra- Lord Ram gave uh, while he was killing, uh, you know, uh, uh, Bali was that uh, that he was in the animal form and it's okay to kill an animal while the person is in the hidden form, like you know they do the Uh, hunting as well, and that also is is that also correct or? Okay, uh, see, and that's why I said that uh, I didn't go into all the reasons, uh-huh, okay, which are listed over there. We, the, when we talk about the contextuality of ethics, that we have to consider whether not just what was the context at that time, but what is the context now. Mm-hmm. In today's world. is that reason going to convince anyone that particular reason when we are teaching scripture it is our responsibility to teach it in a way that is intelligible to the audience mm-hmm. sure, so sure. just so so for example you know who is uh, doing prabhu prabhupad would use the metaphor of the shooting a rhino mm-hmm. that uh-huh. if you he said try something spectacular if you if you don't succeed 
nobody will say oh, it was anyway impossible. If you succeed, everybody will be impressed. Hmm? So hmm. now during those times, if you consider in 50, 60, 100 years ago, hunting was considered to be like a heroic activity. It was considered to be like the pastime or entertainment of uh, entertainment and uh, it was quite an acceptable activity. But in today's hmm. world, rhinos are endangered species and hunting itself is looked down upon. So yeah. when when Shila Prabhupada, uh, was it Shams Sundar Prabhu, I think, or Gurudas yeah. wrote a book. Yeah. Yes. So he, he didn't he call it shooting now. rhino, he called chasing rhino. Yeah. Now Shams Sundar Prabhu, so chasing rhinos. So now actually speaking, there is no such phrase as chasing rhinos. But you know, he can't use the word shooting rhinos. <laughs> <laughs> because that will just uh, put off a lot of people. Although this book is meant for devotees, but still it is, it is so in general, even when we quote from scripture and we give certain reasons that, that, that is why uh, see, the living tradition is required because the reasons, all the reasons given in scripture may not be acceptable for even intelligible for people today. So we have to see what works and what work. The when Prabhupada was asked once that, uh, why do you say that the sun is closer than the moon? Now, of course, mm -hmm. Prabhupada, if you look at Prabhupada's teachings himself, hmm, Prabhupada, has, Prabhupada has uh, given a lot of subtlety. And I have a whole answer about how there's a vertical dimension in the Vedic, dim Vedic cosmology. But Prabhupada at one time gave an answer to uh, he says, uh, why does Sunday come before Monday? Because the sun is closer than the moon. Now, the, the reporter was so taken aback, he just had no other question after that. But uh, and I cannot give that answer. Uh, what is the sequence? Because the, ob the obvious counter question, if a person is not too surprised, that will come is that, that, you know, what is the sequence of the days of the week got to do with the distance? Is it that all the days of the week are based on the distance of the particular celestial objects? That doesn't work for the remaining days. Mm -hmm. It doesn't always work. So, so, so that is that is a, a answer that could work at that time, but that answer may not work at all time. So, yes, the animal answer, animal point is given over there definitely, but we see that even with respect to killing of animals, it's not indiscriminate. Uh, it is, we see in the Prachini Parishad, he performs yagya and he kills animals for performing yagya and still he gets some consequences, even in those times. So the point is that in general, there is an array of arguments. The idea is that there, we give multiple, explain from multiple perspectives and not all those perspectives will make sense to the audience, but Okay, maybe one of those clicks. So Lord Ram is using multiple reasons. So I chose those points which uh, made the most sense to me and which I felt I can explain in a way that can make sense to the contemporary mind. Okay. Sure. Thank you, Prabhuji. That just makes perfect sense. And thank you. Thank you for highlighting the underlying fact as well that, you know, the contextual answer, which is applicable to the audience in present context also makes more sense. So that's, that's yes. a great learning for me as well. Thank you, Prabhu. Thank you, Hare Krishna. Shri Prabhupada Ki Jai. Okay.